So we've been discussing what it means to unite on some common values that honor God with our relationships and especially the ones that matter the most. And we've talked about some of the obstacles or barriers that we bring into our marriages. It's been a really good process for me to listen to Scott teach on that. Those things that affect how we see life and how we treat each other. Uh, And they come in the form of expectations. Uh, The image we've been building is this image of uh, a wall of bricks. And as we've gone through this series, we've taken a look at 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 what these things have done to us in some cases and how they have ruined some things or potentially ruined some things or caused some hardship in our relationship. Uh, But in the last couple weeks, we've really started to dive into a different kind of wall, a support wall and what that looks like. You see, the foundation for unity is when we acknowledge that it is our responsibility to meet the expectations of God in our marriage. It's not my spouse's job to meet my expectations, and it's not hers to meet mine. God is fully capable of being my God, and my spouse doesn't have to carry that burden. If I'm going to meet God's expectations for my marriage, it will be willingly, or it will come in the form of me doing three primary things to the best of my ability. Uh, First is I will submit humbly to God. Second, I will surrender willingly to the roles of marriage. And then third is I will sacrifice for my wife. For you, maybe that means you will sacrifice for your husband. And today I want us to go a step further. Actually, Scott wants us to go a step further. Uh, Let's talk about how we raise our kids to be spiritual champions. What, what does it take to raise kids who love God first and the love that impacts the decisions they make, the way they treat each other, and the path that their life takes for the future? Throughout my 21 years of parenting, uh, I've struggled just like many of you. I've felt woefully inadequate as a parent, and I've made my share of mistakes. But I will tell you, I have never done anything more difficult than being a responsible husband and dad. Amen? Uh, there is nothing more difficult in this world to do. Now, I've struggled, and you probably will as well with this. And here's the hard truth. You may pour yourself fully into parenting, and you may not have all the results you hoped for. Now, I'm just asking that you unite, or for some of you, that you reunite with the goal to do your best you can with, with letting God lead you. Uh, but let's all learn some things that will help us to raise really good kids. The Barna Group, a research organization, has done extensive research on the topic of young adults who seem to be living a life of spiritual excellence. The national uh, sample was people in their 20s who were living a life of strong faith, moral excellence, and leading their peers spiritually. And so they interviewed thousands of them as identified by their peers and their church leaders, employers, and educators. And then they interviewed their parents. And again, their goal was to determine what makes a spiritual champion and how do we build towards that? And what are the things that those kids and their parents have in common? Uh, Maybe you've heard a lot of people fearfully ask, well, how are we going to survive in this new world order that seems to be wrought with evil all around us? How are we going to change the world? What can I do? I'm I'm just one person. What can I do to affect change? See, the greatest opportunity we will have to affect a big, bad, scary world, well, that'll come in how we raise kids. Because we may not change things today or tomorrow. But we can change things 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago by doing that job and doing that really well. The book of Proverbs has some things to say about raising spiritual champions. And there's a couple of pretty well-known verses in Proverbs 22 that we could cherry pick today. But instead, uh, we just want to bask in the first 16 verses of Proverbs chapter 22 in context and talk about what it means to be uh, adults who raise spiritual champions. And so if you want to turn to that on your, in your Bible or on your app or, or whatever you're using this morning, uh, that's where we'll camp for the whole morning. 
So starting in verse 1, we read this. A sterling reputation is better than striking it rich. A gracious spirit is better than money in the bank. The rich honor the poor and shake hands as equals. God made them both. A prudent person sees trouble coming and ducks. A simpleton walks in blindly and is clobbered. The payoff for meekness and fear of God is plenty and honor and a satisfying life. The perverse travel a dangerous road, potholed and mud slick, and if you know what's good for you, you'll stay clear of it. Point your kids in the right direction, and when they're old, they won't be lost. The poor are always ruled over by the rich, so don't borrow and put yourself under their power. Whoever sows sin reaps weeds, and bullying anger sputters into nothing. Generous hands are blessed hands because they give bread to the poor. Kick out the troublemakers and things will quiet down. You need a break from bickering and griping. And again, we could all say amen to that. God loves the pure-hearted and the well-spoken. Good leaders also delight in their friendship. God guards knowledge with a passion, but he'll have nothing to do with deception. The loafer says there's a lion on the loose. If I go outside, I'll be eaten alive. The mouth of a prostitute is a bottomless pit. You'll, find, you'll fall in that pit if you're on the outs with God. Young people are prone. It doesn't just say you're young people. Young people are prone to foolishness and fads. The cure comes through tough-minded discipline. Exploit the poor or glad hand the rich, whichever, and you'll end up the poorer for it. There's so much in this passage that we could focus on, and there's just really a lot to unpack in there. But in interest of time this morning, we're going to highlight the building blocks for making spiritual champions at home. Let's do something today that will give us a chance at making a difference for tomorrow. Uh, Let's together set aside those feelings of failure and rebuild from the ground up. Because if I asked you to raise your hands, if you've had some failures in this area of life, you'd be lying if you didn't raise your hands. A sharp word, uh, 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 an ear that's closed off to listening, whatever that might be, we've had failures. And, And here's the promise, we will continue to have failures. But we can start to build this wall in the right way at any time. So let's set aside those feelings and build from the ground up because wherever you are, whatever mistakes you've made in the past, if you are breathing, you're not done. If your kids are adults, there is a chance to go back and make things right. If your your kids are teenagers, they won't be forever. We'll get through this and we can build from scratch. And so this morning we've asked some friends of ours to come and help us build this block and uh, and so this morning, as uh, uh, Annika and Aaron and Morgan come out here, uh, the, the first building block that we want to talk about is that we need to be intentional. Yeah, I told you about the table. You were very excited. Good job. We should clap for her. <laughs> she was just a little nervous. Be intentional. What will be the lens through which our kids view the world? As Christian parents, we want to direct that. You see, they will have plenty of other influences, as you well know. They will have years of education from a variety of resources. School, peers, their own siblings. Uh, And when we were young, A lot of us, most of us, we didn't have that little tiny computer that we carried around with us all day long that gave us access to everything. The influence that your kids will have is immense. But the most important influence that ought to be in their world is you and me. Together as we parent and see what that does. And and, and we give a good influence in the midst of all of the bad influence that surrounds them. So be intentional about leading them. 
Verse 6 said, point your kids in the right direction. Man, what a great promise. And when they are old, they will not be lost. It doesn't happen by accident. Today in America, only one in three children ages 8 to 12 believe that the Bible is something that is important or that they can trust. And most kids do not believe that the Bible is a necessity for their future success in life and for that of our culture. But understand this, God's word It is the directional tool that gets them home to God. And so a question for you to think about, are you intentionally building the foundation that places God's written word as a priority in your family? Because verse 12 tells us God guards knowledge with a passion, but he'll have nothing to do with deception. See, you are the parent. You are the adult. And they're the kids, so you lead the way. You give the example for them to follow, and you do that by bringing your family into this Bible-believing church. You do that by being in a small group that opens God's word, uh, even in your home. See, when you yourself are a person who will step in and use your gifts to teach and lead kids and kids ministry, all of that shows that God's written word is a priority. I remember as a teenager, when I finally started waking up to go to work before 8 a.m., and I noticed my parents every morning at the kitchen table uh, reading the word of God together. And I didn't see that when I was younger. My parents were in process in their faith. But as I got older, maybe because I was the fourth of four boys, (laughs) they realized we need something. And they started opening up God's word, and it started making a bigger difference in their life. And it set a model for me of what that could look like in my life. Their intentionality mattered, and it made a difference in my life. And I'm so thankful that they answered that question. Yes, we will intentionally build a foundation that places God's written word as a priority in our family. Another question, how are you letting God be at the center of this? Because in the climate we live in, you can't do this alone. We do need the church together. We do need friends who will encourage our kids. Uh, I I have people who will speak into my kid's life, whether they know it or not. Whether they know that I'm part of in the background saying, go talk to my kid. They'll do it. Because they care about me, and as a result of that, they care about my kids. But ultimately, it comes from this place of they care about the church and they care about God and they want my kids to end up in a really, really good place. It takes all of us together to get there. So next, Ian Komacher is going to come out here and he's going to lay a brick uh, on our wall that represents the second principle for raising a spiritual champion. Doesn't he look sharp? Look at this. Yeah. Nice job. They still sell suit coats. Who knew, right? (laughs) Building block two is that we would lead them with good character. As Proverbs 22 puts it, uh, whoever sows sin reaps weeds, and bullying anger sputters into nothing. The perverse travel a dangerous road, potholed and mud slick, and if you know what's good for you, stay clear of it. Uh, What are you sowing? What is your example? What is your reputation in the community, in the neighborhood, at the school, in the gym, or at the Performing Arts Center? Are you modeling prioritized generosity or sticky fingers? Which is it for you? You see, a sterling reputation is better than striking it rich. A gracious spirit is better than money in the bank. And generous hands are blessed hands because... They give bread to the poor. What do they hear come from your mouth about the people you work with, the people who lead your kids? Because God loves the pure-hearted and the well-spoken. Good leaders also delight in their friendship. Kids who grow up to be spiritual champions are people who develop character. You see, there's a lot of ways to develop character in kids, and the top way is to make good choices, moral choices, ourselves. Not just expect them to do so. They need to see that start and come from us. That 
when given that chance to cheat a little bit, we don't. When given the chance to, to maybe just tell a little bit of gossip, we choose not to. We make good choices and it results in them growing up to be people who will make good choices. You see, and it's when we abdicate the character building of our kids to others that things go awry. It's believing the lie that character will come from athletics or from education or from extracurricular involvement. Now, understand this. Those things can be good and they have a place. And the people who teach our kids and coach them and lead them can have huge character building impact on them. But your kids will develop character primarily from your example and your teaching period. It's from you from mom and it's from dad and those people who are close to your family unit who are going to have that impact. And understand this, it doesn't even come from their student minister or their, or their kid city coach. It comes from you primarily. These are wonderful things, great things. And there are so many kids who come to these programs who don't have a, a, a spiritual family so I'm so glad that we have that. And I'm so glad that your kids, even when, even when they're growing up in a, in a great home, that they have these things because it makes them even stronger. And it puts them into a position of leadership for kids their age. But do not abdicate the responsibility that is yours and yours primarily. <clears throat> See, there's times when building character will make you unpopular with your own kids. <laughs> you will have resistance and there will be pain and disruption and you're going to have to work through that. See, in thinking about raising my kids, sometimes I wanted to be their friend more than their parent. That's a trap that's easy for us to fall into and sometimes difficult for us to get out of because it looks pretty different to them when we go from, hey buddy, to knock it off. You can do this so much better. You were, you were created for good. Live in that good. Sometimes we have to be willing to be unpopular. We've had some discussion over the years, and uh, you know there were times where we had enthusiastic conversations about choices of clothes, uh, the friends that they were hanging around with, and priorities concerning sports and other activities, uh, and how that relates to spiritual matters. And from time to time, there were even those conversations about activity with people of the opposite gender. And those are important moments, but they weren't popular moments. Are you willing to be the, po the, the one who isn't popular for the sake of developing character in your kids or in your grandkids? See, if you're always their best friend, you have a problem. And if you are always their enemy, you've also got a problem. How can you develop partnership with them where you can provide adult wisdom, structure, stability, and example? Bring encouragement. They understand your heart, even if they don't at the moment. And we've all had those. We've had those moments where in the moment they're just angry. And they just look at you like you don't know anything in the whole wide world. But at some point they're going to be 51. And they're going to look back at the example that mom and dad set. And they're just going to be overwhelmed with gratitude because you put God first in your life and the life of your family. And so the question for you on this one, how often are you unpopular with your kids because of the stands you have taken to develop their character? The next Julian Campos is going to come out here and he's going to lay a brick that represents the third principle for raising a spiritual champion. You also look sharp. I told him I like hoodies. <laughs> I did warn people beforehand that when we're using bricks on a table that does this, front row is on you, right? So we have uh, waivers you can sign in the, in the plaza this morning. The, the third building block is that we establish boundaries. We draw lines in the sand for your kids and stick to them. Verse 15 says, young people are prone to foolishness and fads. Uh, the cure comes through tough-minded discipleship. And a prudent person sees trouble coming and ducks 
a simpleton walks in blindly and is clobbered. It seems like a lot of families are getting clobbered, doesn't it? Maybe your own family. At times, my family. Uh, Getting clobbered by culture. It seems like a lot of parents are getting clobbered by their own apathy. And they're always uh, reacting and not necessarily anticipating. And there's no boundaries and their kids push the limits and the kids win. See, when you anticipate, you can plan on how you will respond. But when you're apathetic and complacent, you're going to get dominated. You will no longer be the lead of your family. Your kids will be. Barn has done research on how kids become revolutionary leaders. And one of the things that the research shows is that those now young adults had parents who courageously set boundaries for them as children. There was a consistency in setting and enforcing rules and boundaries on things that really mattered. You and I, as parents, can fight all day with our kids really easily. So we need to have showdowns when it matters. Selective showdowns. You choose your battles. You don't fight everything. You fight the ones that matter. Otherwise, all you'll be doing is battling. And just pure honesty, I have had to fight through that in my house. Because I want things to be a certain way. And sometimes they're on things that don't really matter. And sometimes they're on matters of preference rather than important priority. Realize that you're not just having a showdown with your kid. You may be battling with the culture that they live in. And you may be battling against the teachings they're receiving from public education and and from that tiny computer that they carry around with them and look at, on average, more than five hours per day. So be aware. Be consistently enforcing that we know what is right important, and needed in their life. So here's a challenge for you. Uh, Identify four to five non-negotiable boundaries for your kids that mesh with the goals you have set for them. Then stand your ground. Be built on rock, not on shifting sand. Stand firm in their life and have those expectations of what life can look for them. And understand that if your child is three, those, those objectives, they look different than if they're 18. They look different than if they're 12. And so those are going to need to change. And for some of you who haven't stepped into parenthood yet, man, what a great opportunity for you to start writing down some priorities that you want to have. And for those of you who have, you're feeling like, ah, this is all past me. No. You can catch up with your kids, and you can impact the way that they parent their kids, your grandkids. You can have a generational difference because you change today how you're going to be. For this fourth building block, uh, Kaylee Mushin is on her way out here, and she's, uh, she's bringing a brick that represents uh, that we need to behave like a parent. Thank you. And honestly, here might be the greatest challenge that some of you will face as you raise revolutionary adult children. You will struggle with behaving like a parent. If you ask 20-somethings who are living uh, to know and honor God, who are developing Christ-like character and who are making a difference in the world, many of them will tell you that their parents are parents, that their parents weren't their best friends. Their parents weren't just their cheerleader at the sports event. Their parents weren't just the taxi driver. Their parents were their parent. And they did the hard work of being a parent. One of the common traits of revolutionary parents is they give a reason behind the why. I think we all had that moment with our parents where we said, well, why do I have to do that? And we got the answer, because I said so, right? Um, let's, let's break that habit. Uh, let's be ready to give an answer to the why. Now, there will be times 
if they're about to touch a hot stove where you don't have to explain, well, you know, that's at 375 degrees Celsius, and if you touch that, it's going to cause uh, the need for skin grafts, and it's gonna, you don't have time. Sometimes there's a, there's a moment for, because I said so. But that ought to be rare. And we can explain it's because I'm trying to raise you as a person of godly character. And this is how that goes against that goal. It's tough. It's work. And it might be tiring. It requires some thought as to where this might lead and how it might fit into the context of their future choices and character. Uh, For instance, always knowing where they are going. This means that your head needs to be in the game. Knowing how they are using the media monster you placed in their hands, that takes diligence. And not just going with the flow because their friends are all doing it. Uh, It's the easy way. It takes work to fight through it, to think through it, and to design where the flow is going. Parents sometimes have what what could be called hard behaviors. Proverbs 22 verse 10 says, kick out the troublemaker and things will quiet down. You need a break from the bickering and the griping. See, it's not easy to confront a kid of any age who is constantly argumentative, rebellious, and critical of the family. And it may take a hard line stance of saying, no more. Another example, the loafer says, there is a lion on the loose and if I go out, I'll be eaten alive. This is what we see more and more with the generation that's living in fear and uses it as an excuse not to be responsible with their adulthood. And the lion has different skins. Uh, And there's a point where behaving like a parent requires you to, to what? To parent. (laughs) You point out that it's loafing and you challenge them to face their fears, hard behaviors of parenting. But there are also soft behaviors of parenting. Uh, This is not the strategic stuff of parenting, but it's more the demeanor or the emotions that we sometimes display in parenting. Temper. Verse 8 says, uh, it identifies bullying anger. Not allowing our temper to get the best of us. In control and rational. And as you know, this can be very, very difficult. But I want to tell you this, there will be times when you lose it, and you can ask my son a few times, I've gone too far, I've said some things that I desperately wish I could take back, but that's not necessarily failure. If I take advantage of that moment, and I go to his room, or I turn to him in the car and say, I was out of line, forgive me, because that shows them something about your faith. It shows them something about your desire and your intentions that you care about them and that you're still in process of becoming a little bit more like Jesus. Failure isn't final when it comes to parenting. What about the art of listening? It is an art. Because sometimes when I'm getting the excuse, I've already made up my mind as to why they did what they did. And maybe I missed something that's really, really important. So try to listen. Don't just talk over them. Listen to what they say and not how they said it. Verse 11 says, God loves the pure-hearted and the well-spoken. So be a good communicator. Communicator includes listening. And then consistency. See, when you talk to kids who grow up Uh, to be highly capable spiritual people, many of them will say, I had consistency in my home. Their parents behaved consistently. Of all the things uh, my mom and dad did, I could count on them to be at that table each morning, reading scripture, and praying for each one of us kids. Probably me the most. Not because I'm the favorite, because I needed it the most. There was consistency in the Walter household, and I'm a better person because of it. So how effective are you at those soft behaviors of parenting, of listening, of temper, of consistency? Are those a regular part of your everyday life? Well, James and Brooke Hale are going to bring out our last brick this morning. And uh, we're going to talk about the example of faith. Thanks, you guys. Newlyweds, by the way, right? 
Verse 4 says, The payoff for meekness and fear of God is plenty and honor and a satisfying life. The most important thing that parents can pass on to their kids is faith in God. What I've learned over the course of years is that faith isn't primarily developed by more information. Faith is often more caught than taught. So when they see you make it a priority in your life, they're more likely to make it a priority in their life. Faith is grasped and developed primarily by that example. See, they see that it makes a huge impact on you, and they want that in their own lives. And it may take a while. It may take a lifetime. But they see it. And they know that it's home. And they know that they can go home anytime they want. Not necessarily your home. They can go to the home of faith because they were shown what that looks like. See, we've made a huge mistake in our country. We've come to believe that parenting is more about technique than anything else. You see, it's about giving our kids experiences that help them learn to succeed. It's about putting them in the right places, the right schools, on the right teams, or in the best studios. And those aren't wrong things, but they're not the thing. Loving kids isn't about technique. It's about your heart. It's about your soul, your spirit, your growth, and your faith. So you pour that in the life of your kids. And let me challenge you. Are you, recycling, are you, are you relying on technique or example of faith? You can read all kinds of books. And listen to all kinds of podcasts about the 10 steps of being a successful parent. And you might pick up some really good tips. But the Bible doesn't give us 10 steps, at least not that we've really been able to identify. Not just a, a quick 10, here's, here's the 10, you know, quick tricks of parenting. It's not in there. If you find it, let us know. Um, it's never too late for me either. But God's word, it wants to shape us into being someone that has something to give that's greater than anything this world has to offer. That's what a servant is. A servant gives the most important thing they have because of love. If you love your kids, and I, I, I know that you do, then pass on your faith to them. Here's the deal. At some point, a revolutionary parent sets aside the magic steps and lives in faith. And that's what Jesus modeled for us and ultimately gave his life for. And because he was willing to live a life of modeling, of being an example, and ultimately a life of sacrifice on the cross, we get to live in a reunion with the Creator, our Father in Heaven. So Lord, we take uh, this moment, a little piece of bread and cup of juice and we give thanks that even though we were kids who had wandered far from home you were right there by the road running to us when we came back to you and you weren't looking for an explanation you simply wanted our hearts back we thank you for Jesus because he made that possible. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. I had a wonderful childhood. <laughs> uh, parents who taught me a lot. Uh, a, a, a dad that wasn't so addicted to sports on TV. That's not a dig, because I struggle with that. But we spent time together. But one of the greatest things my parents did for me is they showed me that it was important to be involved in their church. Like I knew that there were times that my dad might miss a game or a concert because there was something really important going on. Same thing's still true. I knew my dad loved me. I knew that my dad was going to be there for me. But I also knew that the church was really important to him. We got a whole bunch of kids here who don't have the kind of family that we're talking about. 
maybe you're someone who can kind of step in and be that adoptive parent spiritually. And to pour into kids, to pour into high schoolers, pour into middle schoolers in a way that does exactly what we're talking about for people who aren't your physical flesh and blood. If you want to be part of that, you can go on our website and fill out a serve form or you can stop at uh, one of the one of the hubs as you leave the building this morning or on our app and fill that out and just say, I'm, I'm willing to help. I'm willing to step into that gap for kids who need it.